Well, good morning, FFMC family and friends. It's so good to be with you again today. My name is Scott Gentry. I'm the senior pastor here at Ferndale Free Methodist Church. And so if you are joining with us, if it's your regular habit to be with us on Sunday mornings, a, a greeting to you. Uh, for those of you near and far, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. Uh, we are so excited to be able to provide uh, this service again today and to have so many people engaging with us. And if you happen to be with, be with us today for the very first time, I just thank you so much for joining and being a part of the service. Our hope today is that you're going to be encouraged just in life in general, but particularly your life and your relationship with God, that you'll deepen your trust in God and that you will actually be equipped to make a difference in this world today. As we begin our service, we're going to sing a song together called Build My Life. But before we do that, I wanted to share just this scripture verse with you. It's from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. And that verse says this, For no one can lay up any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And this song is all about the foundation we build our lives on. And there's no greater foundation than Christ. You see, as a church, we believe that if we place our faith, our hope, our trust in Jesus, if we build our lives on the foundation of Christ, and if we give ourselves fully to God, then he will do things in us, both individually as a, and as a church, that we could never imagine. I believe he'll use us to literally change our world all for the glory of Jesus. So as we sing this song today, let's declare that together, that we will build our lives upon the name of Jesus. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you the only one who could ever save worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you
sun beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me well here we are it's the week after Easter you know, we've been meeting remotely like this now for six weeks, and we'll still continue to meet like this for the foreseeable future, even though some things are loosening. But we know for a time period, we're gonna to continue to meet just this way. Yet we can't meet together. We, we long to do that. We can't wait for that day. We, we are isolated in our homes. And we, we really ask the question, how is it that we can be the church? Well, listen, today's theme and then what we're focusing on throughout the whole service is this. You can't quarantine the mission, right? We're still moving forward. We're still committed to make an impact, uh, to fulfill our mission, which is to connect with Christ, grow in faith, and to serve others. And so today's service is all about action, focusing on the things that we can do. You're going to hear examples of, of how you can be involved in fulfilling that mission. We're actually going to give you opportunities to be able to take some action steps, to be able to commit yourself to being fully engaged in the work that God is doing. And we hope that you'll accept that challenge. So with this in mind, watch this little video clip that we put together that we're just calling Still on Mission. Good morning. My name is Sherry, and I'm part of our guest services team here at Ferndale Free Methodist Church. Welcome. Whether you're joining us from near or far, it's our honor to have you worship with us today. Here we are. It's the week after Easter, and so we're reminded that we're living in the reality of Jesus' resurrection. And you know, we're a church that's still on mission. And that's what today's service is all about. Even though we can't meet together, we are still the church. And as Jesus' church, he has work for us to do today. I want to tell you about one way that you can help us fulfill our mission to serve people by donating to our food pantry. With so many people out of work, our pantry is being utilized by many in need in our church and our surrounding community. With keeping social distancing in mind, we are setting up a new drop box outside the doors of the church. And I am so excited about this. You can simply drop off your food donations and place them in the box. And they'll be gathered daily, sanitized, and put in our pantry for distribution to bless others. Thanks for helping us fulfill our mission to connect, grow, and serve. Now, let's hear what Pastor Laura has to share with our kids and how they can be part of our mission too. Thank you so much. You have a beautiful and blessed day. Hello all, my name is Pastor Laura and I am the children's pastor here at Ferndale Free Methodist Church and I have another object lesson for our kids. But as I always say, it doesn't just apply to kids, adults can learn something too. 
So we're talking about prayer. We're talking about how to pray, the importance of praying. But for kids, praying can be very overwhelming. We don't always know where to start. So brought this handy dandy prayer, five finger prayer guide to help us get started to remember how to pray. So we start with the orange thumb. The thumb is the closest finger to the heart. So it represents people who are close to us, like our family and friends. The purple represents the pointer finger, which represents people who point us in the right direction, like teachers and coaches and first responders who keep us safe. Those people need prayer. And then we have the middle finger, the blue one. It represents government leaders. See how it's the tallest one? It represents our president and our governor and other people who need our who create rules and regulations who need our prayers. And then we have the green finger. It's our ring finger. And the ring finger is the weakest finger on the hand. So it represents the people who are sick and poor and vulnerable. So people all over the world are fighting coronavirus and they are very sick and they need our prayer. The yellow finger on the end represents ourselves. This is when we pray and ask God to help us be obedient, help us to listen to those in authority and other prayer requests that we have regarding ourselves. And those are the five finger prayer guide. We're starting with those we are close to, people who give us direction, our government leaders, people who are sick and ourselves. Now for the adults, I have created a prayer guide and what this is, is this is a two week long prayer guide. This is actually the last day of part two. And every day we pray for the five prayer objectives at the top and the prayer objective that coordinates with the day of the week. This is available on the Ferndale Free Methodist Church group page that our part three is. So part two, the last day is those with birthdays during time of social distancing. That's our main topic that we're praying for today. And on part three, that's available on the Ferndale Free Methodist Church group page, uh, is the same today as it is on part three. So that's available on there. Parents, don't forget, we have the Zoom meeting for the kids at two o'clock. We are continuing through our Bible in a year with the story of Jonah today. The link to that, along with the password and step-by-step -step instructions for how Zoom works, is available on the Ferndale Free Methodist Church group page. And like I said, that is at two o'clock. You, um, your kid is, does not have to participate in this normally in order for them to join us this week. Even if they haven't joined any other weeks, they are welcome and we would love to have them. See y'all at two. Morning everyone, happy Sunday. I'm Michael, I'm one of the pastors here on staff. It's good to be with you today. Our theme for the day is all about moving forward. You can't quarantine our mission, the things that we're supposed to be up to as a church. How we pursue it might look a little bit different, but that's still a mission that we all share and that we have. So our mission as a church is quite simple. It's to connect, to grow, and to serve. That is to connect with Christ, to grow in our faith, and then to serve others. And everything that we do is about those things. And if there's something that we might be interested in that doesn't quite align with that mission, then it's quite simple. We don't do it. But in circumstances like this, how can we still be on mission? First of all, as a church, we can continue to move forward in ministry. We can continue to move forward in the things that are already happening. So here are some examples. Small groups and classes that are continuing to meet virtually, so I'd encourage you to be a part of those if those are an option for you. Pastor Laura, she's doing a program with our children then uh, virtually as well. In our youth group, we meet on Wednesdays at our normal time, but uh, over Zoom. And we have some fun and some games and some prizes, a chance just to connect with people, and then a devotional that's supposed to give us some encouragement and strength for the day. Our most recent prize was a, a student won a pizza uh, that was delivered to them at a time of my choosing. Sherry mentioned earlier that we are streamlining the way that we can donate food, and so we'd like to, you to really kind of dig in and be a part of that process because this is a huge need in our community. And we have several people making masks for those that need them, and there'll be more uh, about that uh, coming up, but the list kind of goes on. And so if, if there, there's things that I haven't mentioned yet, but I'd like you to see how you can contribute or be a part of maybe those things. If you're currently not involved in these, uh, please consider some ways that you can still serve, ways that you can still be a part of the mission of the church, even while you're stuck in your home. So here's a few examples of things that you can do. First of all, you can ramp up your prayer life. It should be the, the place that we all start. This is uh, the very beginning for everybody. Whatever we're doing now, we should stop and we should pray and we should pray more. 
Maybe you can crack open that Bible uh, a bit more or refresh that Bible app. This is a great time to kind of invest in your faith and to dig in a bit further. You can FaceTime with friends while you pray together or discuss a portion of the Bible or a subject of our faith. You can check in with one another. Call your grandma. She's lonely. And here's one more thing that you can start today. That is tip well. If you're fortunate enough to be able to order food or to have it delivered to you or to be able to use a shopping app to, app to where people then bring you your groceries, make sure that you uh, tip and not just tip okay, but tip well. Christians should already be the best tippers. Uh, there's still work to do on that though. So make sure that you are the best per part of that person's day. Uh, this is something that we can easily do to show the love of Christ. If a couple more dollars on our part means a lot to somebody else. There are so many ways that we can join in in what God is already doing. If uh, there's something that I haven't mentioned that you've been inspired by or you'd like to then inspire other people, make sure you put that in the comments. You might find that you're already joining in something that God is already doing and you're not even aware of it. Like for example, in the road to Emmaus in the book of Luke, this is a story where uh, Jesus started to appear to some of his disciples after the resurrection. We read in Luke 24, 13 through 17 where it says, now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him, and he asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? The story continues, and they basically accuse this guy of living under a rock, not being aware of these crazy events that just happened. But later on, they realized that this dude was Jesus the whole time. You might already be onto something, so keep moving forward. And then one of my favorite Bible verses comes from John 20, 21, where Jesus invites us to something, where we have heard of the Great Commission. This is sometimes called the, the Little Commission. This is where he says, As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. He's telling this to his disciples, to the people following after him. He's now sending them. He's having them move forward to continue on in their mission. So while you shelter in place, realize that you're also being sent. Prayerfully consider how you can continue to move forward in our mission as a church. One of the ways we've been able to reach out to our community is by making face masks. We've been able to make hundreds of these. We've made them for people in the hospital. We've made them for uh, um, hospital workers, health care workers. We've made them for people at our church, for people in grocery stores, people all over. And so there's a lot of people involved in this. And uh, so I want to say thank you to everyone who's participating. But this really comes down to it's, it's the brainchild of uh, a woman in our church named Karen. And I'd like you to hear from her about how this all got started. Hello, my name is Karen Friedrich, for those of you who don't know. Pastor Scott has asked me to share with you how the mask project happened. I can tell you this, it has been God's project from the very start. But it did have a start. Terrible news about the coronavirus was everywhere, and it was scary. The virus is here. What's going to happen? In Sunday school class, we'd been saying faith, not fear. I kept saying that over and over in my head. But this is some scary stuff. The only place I could go to get rid of the fear and the angst that I was living with was in prayer. And I laid everything on the line. God, my daughter could get it at work at Aldi's. Please protect Dr. Jim and my niece, Laura, at, at Beaumont Emergency. Lord, what if my mom gets it? Please, you've got to give her protection. How about my church family? What are they going to do? How are the older people in the congregation still going to go to their doctor's appointments? Lord, what if my brother Carl got it? He is just clinging on to life. What is going on, Lord? What are we gonna do with three grandkids, 50 hours a week, help? Please, Lord, you gotta do something. I will never leave you or forsake you. His words of comfort came into my mind and went straight to my heart. He was doing something. He would work through his people like he always does. What can I do, Lord? Over the next few days, what he wanted of me became very clear. A news program we watched alerted the nation to the need for face masks. Frontline workers needed to be protected. A heartfelt plea for everyone who could so went out. Okay, Lord, you want me to make masks? I can do that. The next several days were so busy as God put all the pieces together. 
He helped me create a pattern for the mask that in my mind at least exceeded the CDC guidelines that I had found online. God navigated me to the supplies that we needed that were already becoming scarce. Pastor Michael came on board and we were in business. I converted my craft room and my laundry room to a makeshift mask making factory and started sewing. The funny thing is, is that when you sew, you have lots of time to think about things and it became the perfect time to pray. Mostly alone for hours upon hours making these masks, I had some really awesome conversations with God and I'm no longer afraid. The pandemic is still claiming lives and it's still really, really scary. But through this mask thing, God keeps reminding me over and over, I got this. Besides, I don't have time to be afraid. I still have masks to make. Stay well and stay safe. I want to thank uh, all those uh, of you again who are continuing to support our church on a regular basis. It means so much to us. Uh, we're so glad that we have uh, the option for online giving. That's the easy way for so many people to give. If that's not your, your current pattern for giving and that's something you'd like to explore, I invite you to go to our church website, ferndellefmc.com, go to the Donate tab, and then you can walk through steps very easily how to give online. You can do that through a variety of ways. You can do that just through a, an electronic check out of your, your uh, checking account. You can do it through a debit card, a credit card. If you do give through a credit card, again, we ask that you would do that responsibly. We don't want persons who already have a, a debt problem uh, to say, I'm going to give to the church and increase your debt problem. We don't want you to do that. But that online portal is a way that allows you, when you're not physically present, to be able to give. Listen, I extend an invitation to those of you who are watching and, and have been a part of our services here for these last six weeks uh, from, from places outside of our, our Ferndale uh, family here. But if, if you are in other cities and states and you joined us and you would like to be able to give uh, to us to support the ongoing ministry, I invite you and encourage you to do that. We're just so thankful that uh, we have the support uh, to continue to do ministry. But it is a reality that since we're not physically gathering together, that many people who give their offering uh, to the Lord here, they do that in person in, the, in our services. That's not being done. So we just want to encourage all of you to continue your faithful support of ministry. We are continuing to do ministry every day. Uh, we're excited to see how our staff, our leaders, our small group leaders are all engaging, helping to make a difference. And so uh, we rely on your faithfulness to continue to trust the Lord and to support ministry. So thank you. I encourage you to uh, to uh, make your offering today in whatever avenue and way you choose to do that. Uh, God will bless you for it. And again, we're very grateful for that. Thank you. This is a reading from the living word of God from Luke 24, 35 through 48. And this begins when two of Jesus's followers are on the road to Emmaus and recognize Jesus. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Jesus appears to his disciples. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they had seen a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your mind? It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and die. 
and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you will be witnesses of these things. We thank you, Kathy, for reading that gospel lesson. You know, in Luke's gospel, the disciples begin to experience uh, the risen Jesus in different places in, uh, in a variety of ways. They experience confusion, uh, disbelief even, and astonishment as the truth of the resurrection begins to dawn on them. So in this passage, the disciples tell how Jesus has revealed himself through the breaking of bread uh, there with those disciples in Emmaus. And as they tell the story to the other disciples in Jerusalem, Jesus appears to them. Can you imagine if you were in that group? I mean, what do you experience uh, if you encounter the risen Jesus? Well, that's a question for us today because Jesus is risen and he is with us today. And, and so we say, Lord, how, how do I encounter you today? Jesus encouraged his disciples not to doubt him. And one of the questions that we ask ourselves, especially during this time, is what causes us to doubt Jesus? What causes us uh, to maybe even doubt our faith? Perhaps you've experienced more doubt in this pandemic than uh, ever before. Are you finding it a challenge to believe? Well, if that's the case, share that with Jesus. I mean, go to prayer and just say, you know, Lord, this is, this is what I'm, I'm feeling. Trust him as you continue to have those questions. That's exactly what those early disciples did, even though they were seeing him right in front of them, the resurrected Jesus. They still had questions. They were still trying to make sense out of it all. As we continue on in worship, we're going to sing another song as part of our service today. And it's a reminder of what God has done for us, a reminder of his faithfulness. I love this song. It's called Living Hope. So as we sing it, let's offer God our worship right now and be able to rest again in that living hope we have in the resurrected Jesus.
Well, I want to thank you again for allowing me just to share just a few moments with you. Uh, just a message that I think that will be encouraging to us. Again, our whole service has been on action. And so uh, that's uh, where my heartbeat is today and some of the things that I'll share with you. You know, when I reflect on where we are, I mean, we're still not meeting face to face. Uh, we're still in isolation in our homes. And though things seem to be approving, uh, improving, uh, it'll still be a while before we can get back to normal. And what normal is going to look like is still to, to be uh, seen. Uh, but what, the question that I have for us is, well, what do we do in the meantime? And, and I want to share some things with you that I think will be helpful. The first is an interesting little uh, an article, an excerpt actually from a journal that I want to read with you. This is from the journal of Bishop B.R. Jones. Now, Bishop B.R. Jones was a bishop in the Free Methodist Church in 1918. He was residing in Pasadena, California. And remember, at 1918, uh, that was the time of the, the Spanish flu that was going around. It was right at the end of World War I. And I, I want to, uh, to read an excerpt that we have uh, from his journal, just some short things that he wrote of what they were experiencing at this time. Here's the first. I'm just going to read it to you here. October 11th, 1918. The Spanish influenza has struck the cities. Many cases reported and some deaths. Churches, theaters, and public places of gathering are ordered closed. Interesting. The next day, October 12th, all schools in Los Angeles and Pasadena closed indefinitely on account of the influenza epidemic. The old Kaiser will say Providence is helping him out. Still, he is on the retreat. He's referring to the, the war that's raging, raging there in World War I. October 16th, Telegram from Bishop Selu says that we cannot meet in Chicago for our, an, our annual board meetings because of this epidemic. Sad conditions the whole world is in. The war is still raging. Peace is not yet in sight. October 18th, much excitement throughout the country over the war and the epidemic conditions. October 23rd, the epidemic is still raging. The war is still raging. Thousands dying daily. Poor old world. October 25th, we're looking to the Lord for protection from the epidemic that is sweeping over the country. November 10th, now this is a month after he first starts writing his journal. Five weeks, the churches are still closed. A week later, November 18th, a free Methodist paper arrived this, this evening. A number of deaths from the influenza reported. So people were reporting even deaths within the free Methodist community there. Now he's into December, December 3rd. The ban is lifted, schools are open, interesting. December 8th, this is our ninth Sabbath that our churches have been closed. Offerings are being taken for the pastors. Just a couple more with these. December 10th, we meet with unexplainable providences. We have assurances, so God is coming through and being faithful. But on December 11th, more flu cases. December 12th, Professor F called to inform us of new cases of the flu in the Herman Seminary and the schools in Los Angeles are closed indefinitely so that they had opened schools and they had to close them again. December 15th, the influenza ban is still on in our city and the churches are yet closed. This epidemic is a fearful setback to the work of our church. The Lord knows best, in him we trust. And then the last entry here, December 29th, churches opened today. Ruth, I'm assuming that's his wife, is off to Sunday school on time. Helen attended preaching services. I did not venture out yet. And then he gives a reason, I'm not exactly sure. He says, too cloudy for me. I'm sure he wasn't being flippant. There was something that was still going on in his life. 79 days in that journal, he says, from the time that they said that this epidemic began to, uh, to really explode and they began to close things until the churches reopened. So we've been at this again for, for six weeks. Now, I read that because it's a reminder that they went through that in, on top of that with a world war raging. It's amazing. And then they got through it. And then the church began to grow and thrive. And the same is going to be true for us. Now, the second thing that I want to share with you is a situation that I think will be really helpful for us. And it comes from the writings of the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote the majority of our letters in the New Testament. And you may know this, but you may not know this, that Paul was imprisoned a number of times for his faith. 
He was imprisoned at least three times that we know of. And two of those imprisonments were for periods of two years or more. So he, he spent a lot of time where he was not able to do ministry the way that he had been used to doing ministry. And so what we're going to do is to look at some of the things that happened when, when Paul was in prison. He, he wrote some important letters during those imprisonment times. We call them the prison epistles. Epistle just simply means a, a letter or a message. Now, we're not in prison, and I know that there are some people on TV that say, you know, to Governor Whitmer, let us out of, of, of prison. We're not in prison, but we still can't gather together. We are, are still being safe as we stay home and, and stay safe. Uh, but the question for us today is, until we can meet together and get back to, quote, normal, what is it we can do? And what I want to share with you is there are some things we can really learn from the Apostle Paul with this. One of the, the letters that he wrote when he was in prison was the letter to, uh, we call the letter of, of Ephesians. It was written to the people of the church at Ephesus, but really it was a letter that he circulated around that whole region. And it's in that, that letter, Ephesians, and you go to chapter 5 and verses 15 through 17, Paul wrote these words while he was in prison. But here's the words that he wrote. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now, a question for us to ask is, how did Paul's imprisonment impact his ministry? And then how did he, in that situation, make the most of every opportunity? Well, here's the first impact that it had with him. Paul couldn't go and visit the churches like he used to. It was his regular habit that he would go to city to city and meet with churches and leaders and teach and equip them and help them to be able to carry on the work of the church, but he couldn't do that now, especially in these two two-year imprisonment terms. So here's what he did as a result. He, his ministry was actually multiplied through other people serving with him. What Paul did was he said, I can't go to the churches and the leaders, but he still was able to have visitors that would come to, to see him. And, and so whenever people would come that he could have contact with, he, he invested in them. He, he poured life into them. He encouraged them in their own faith. He still did personal evangelism, but he said, I can't do ministry the way I used to, but now I'm going to do it in a different way. Another thing that happened as a result of his imprisonment was he was forced to communicate with his churches through another avenue, and that was through the writing of these letters. Now, here's the reality. If Paul had not been in prison, we wouldn't have these prison epistles. He, he wrote while he was in prison the, the books of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and then the, the New Testament letter we have, Philemon. Now, a, Another result of Paul being in prison and, and how that impacted him and how he made the most of this opportunity was this. Because he couldn't minister to churches in person, he spent considerably more time praying for them. He, he often writes in these letters of how much he's praying for the saints. And I'll be honest, when I used to read those New Testament letters and I would read how he'd say, I'm constantly making mention of you in my prayers, constantly praying, I, I would read that. But now that I realize that as he was isolated in, in prison and he could not be with the people, he had time on his hands to pray. And so he was very sincere when he said, I am praying all of the time. He wrote to his protege, Timothy, in a letter that we, we call 2 Timothy. It was the second letter that he wrote to, to Timothy. He wrote these words. This is in chapter 1, verse 3. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. And then he says this, as night and day constantly I remember you in my prayers. So that was a true thing that Paul was saying. In his isolation, I have more time to pray, and I'm finding that I'm praying throughout the day and even throughout the night. So for today in this message, I felt compelled to share some very specific things that we can do, that you can do right now, that follow Paul's example, to make the most of the situation that we're in, to strengthen us spiritually, and to help us fulfill our mission things we can do and things that we should have been doing and that now because we are 
isolated in our homes now that we, we have an opportunity to do these, maybe in a greater measure than we've even had before. Here, here's the first thing that I would say. Following Paul's example, continue to minister to the people that are in your life and care for their needs. Even while we're in isolation, both within and outside the church. Now, we're still saying we're going to be observing social distancing. We're still going to follow all the directives that we have from uh, our, our leaders of, of how we are to do life today. But as we are in this situation, God is going to say, I'm going to put within you a genuine concern to care for and minister to people that are in your life through whatever ways work best. With Paul, he had people that would come to him, and so when they were there, he made the most of that opportunity. He was literally uh, handcuffed, chained to Roman soldiers, and, and he would minister to them. It's, it's very intriguing that even as you read his letters, the impact the gospel was making, he even sends greetings to the church from believers who were in the household of Caesar. It showed that while he was in prison, he was able to impact with the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, those people who were actually working in Caesar's home. He would have never had that opportunity before had he not been in prison, chained to Roman Roman guards and ministering in that context. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, and this again was written from prison, he says this, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. Now, that's, that's a, a really good word for us because as we have time in, in our homes, and you may be there by yourself. You may be there with family members, but it's a word that we can take today, like, God, what can I do? And he says, well, here's what you do. In humility, as you say, God, as, I'm, as I am in this situation, I care about my needs, but I want to make certain that I'm thinking about the needs of other people. See, we can begin serving right, first of all, in our own homes. We can begin to say, how can I be, the, if, if this is your situation, the best husband I can be, the best wife I can be, the best father or mother, even the, the best uh, child. How can, how can I right now be able to say, I want to think about other people in my life. Now, we can do some things around the home to try to make life easier, but, but it can go beyond that too. And I'm going to give you a specific challenge at the end of this message that, uh, that will help you to be able to do this on a daily basis. But the, but the first thought is, in my situation, minister to the people that I can minister to in whatever way works best. Now, we can all do this in our own homes. We, we can think of people. Uh, you can think of people outside of your own home that you could give a phone call to, that you could text them, you can email them, whatever means that is at your disposal, uh, to, to, disposal to say, I want to think of those other persons I want to, to, to say, Lord, what, what do they need? Who are you laying on my heart that I can serve, that I can reach out to, that I can encourage? I, I am so encouraged when, when I, I get texts from you, just like you are receiving texts from other people. People are saying, hey, I'm praying for you today, lifting you up. Hope you're, you're, you're getting your rest, taking care of yourself. You need anything. Those are really encouraging to me. And like you, I'm trying to reach out and talk with people on the phone, text and email people. I can't do that with everyone and neither can you. So the people that are, are in our either our sphere of influence or the people that God has put into our life or God specifically lays on our heart, we can minister to in very specific ways. Now, the point is that we make the most of every opportunity in our present situation and that in this present situation, we are intentionally thinking about other people. Now, even though Paul couldn't go to the churches, he was allowed to receive these visitors, it wasn't just to pass on information. It was to minister to them. Like I said, he, he shared the gospel with people who came to him. He, he was praying for them. And that's one thing that you can do. For the people that God lays on your heart, it could be a neighbor, it could be a coworker that you're not being able to see, it could be someone you're still engaging with in some you know, official way, but the people that God has laid on your heart, look for opportunities to share a word of encouragement, Look for opportunities to say and ask the question, how can I be praying for you and, and to pray for them? And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Look for opportunities even to be able to speak the truth of the gospel to them. Now, here's another thing that we can do. We can take advantage of the time we have 
to deepen our time with God and in God's word. Jesus said this, this is in Matthew chapter four, verse four. This is when he was being tempted by Satan in the wilderness, if you know that, that account. But it's interesting what he says, and it gives great value to us today. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I don't know what it's like for you as you are isolated in home. Uh, my work habit has, has changed. Uh, it seems like that my wife, Leanna, and I, we work, it, it feels like all day long. We, we've gotten into a different flow with that. She's a teacher uh, with the work that I'm doing with the church and, and uh, just not just preparing sermons, but ministering to people throughout the week. There, there is a pattern that's come to that. But, but here's some things that I have seen that have changed. I snack a lot more. I mean, I am, I'm at home and, and I'll do a little work and then I'll get up and I'll go look for a little snack. I, I've even had where, <laughs> I confess this, there was a time when Leanna was going to go in and she was going to make a treat at some chocolate chip cookies and she went in looking and said, hey, where are the chocolate chips? Well, uh, guilty, um, I was craving chocolate and so, uh, you know, those little Nestle morsels were in there. So that became my snack, you know, for the time. Uh, but, but I do see that I'm just going through getting up and like, you know, maybe just a little snack, a little something here or there. Well, Let's put the serious spin on this. Uh, you could literally make a prayer that would say, God, give me a hunger for your word. I, I have time during the day. And, and, and maybe I've had more time than ever to be able to, to spend time reading the Bible. Now, you don't have to, to, to say, I'm going to sit down and read the Bible for one, two, three hours. It's, it's almost like this. In the same way that I get up and say, I think I just want a little snack. Maybe we be, can begin to have this discipline that would just say, God, I don't live on bread alone. I don't live just on snacks. I don't, I don't, I don't want my mind to just simply be controlled with, well, what can I eat today? Maybe what I can do is just say, God, replace that with this spiritual hunger for you that just, I just begin to have this, this, this little nudging that says, why don't you just open up and read a portion of scripture? Why don't you just open up to the Psalms and read encouragement? Listen, one of the most encouraging Psalms that I know a lot of people are reading these days is Psalm 91. Open that up and just say, let me just read a little bit about my confidence that I have in the Lord. Jesus also said, this was in John 6, 63. He said, it is the spirit who gives life the flesh profits nothing. And then he says this, and I love this. The words that I speak to you are spirit. They are life. We find his words in the scriptures. And so if Jesus says, my words to you are life, how do I make the, the most of this current opportunity that I have to be able to read his words and to be able to take in all that God wants to speak to me? You, one of the things that you can do during this time is to say, Lord, I am going to deepen the time I spend with you and with your word. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Some translations say, all scripture is God-breathed. I mean, have you ever thought about this? The Bible is inspired by God himself. It is, it is his word. It contains his wisdom. It contains his goodness. It contains his intentions, his judgments, his heart. Are you interested even right now in just understanding God's will? Well, then spend time in his very word and he will reveal that to you. Another thing you can do to make the most of this opportunity is as you read the Bible, just say, God, give me discernment. There are some things that you have, questions you have in your own life for now and in the future. The author of Hebrews says it this way, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God's word is powerful. It's full of authority. It is a holy two-edged sword that divides between our will and the will of God. The Bible says that of itself that it is a fire that can consume impurity. It says it's like a hammer that has the power to abolish sin in our life. Don't you desire to, to make use of God's word in your own life? When temptation comes, do you have a counterattack to that? Paul wrote in Ephesians 6, 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So the Bible, God's word, it is for us, it's a weapon. It's a sword that gives us power and authority to overcome in the midst of temptation. So 
Why not pick it up today and have all of these things that God is promising that it can accomplish in you become real in your life? And then the last area that I would say that, I, that as we look at Paul's example of what he did in his context as he was in prison was this. He began to pray more. I don't know what your view of prayer is. I don't know if you think that it's just sometimes just our own thoughts. Do you think that we're just kind of talking to the air? Do you think that prayer really makes a difference? Do you really believe that God hears prayer? And more importantly, do you really believe that he moves in response to prayer? In the book of James, the New Testament book of James, in chapter 5, verse 16, James wrote this, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And then he says this, The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Ephesians 6, 18 says this, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for all the Lord's people. We need to take advantage of this time that we have right now to really deepen our prayer life. We need to take advantage of the opportunity we have to, to have time to pray. Now your pattern may be off. My pattern is very off. I don't get up at the same time. I don't go to bed at the same time. It's, it's the, the day feels different. And quite honestly, some days I just forget what day it is. But regardless, we need to take advantage of this to say, Lord, deepen my prayer life. Uh, it, it may be just simply saying, you know, God, I, I want to intentionally uh, set my alarms to have times throughout the day that say I want to just stop and, and pray. Well, what, whatever works for you. My, my advice to you is much like a person who says I want to get in shape and now have the opportunity to get in shape uh, and I'm going to start exercising. Well, don't try to overdo it. Again, if if I would go out and say, I'm going to begin running, I'm not going to say, so I'm going to step out of my house and try to run, you know, five miles. I'm not going to do that. So my advice to you is to, to say, you know, Lord, as you deepen my prayer life, let me just start with some of those, those consistent small steps that when I get up in the morning, my, my pattern will be, Lord, the very first thing I do is I pray. I commit myself to you. The very first thing I do is I pray for the people that are closest to me in my household and for your blessings on their life, protection in their life, and for you to work in their life. And then you can begin to develop this, this prayer list of persons that you would pray for on a regular basis. And again, I'll give you some suggestions for that in a very specific way in just a moment at the close of this message. But every one of us can say, Lord, as I have opportunity now, I want to deepen my prayer life, all right? So as we look at Paul's example, some of the specific things we're saying that we can do for, for this is, one, we're going to be faithful to minister to the people that are in our life. We do that on a regular basis. Two, we're going to say, I'm going to use this, this opportunity I have to try to spend more time with God, to deepen my time with him and in his word. And the third thing is I'm going to say, Lord, I'm going to use the opportunity I have to deepen my prayer life and to be actively involving in praying for other people. Now, listen, these are no small things. This is directly fulfilling the mission God has given us. Our mission as a church says we exist to connect with Christ, grow in faith, and to serve others. And, and if you follow these three examples from Paul, these three directives, you will be fulfilling that mission. You will be doing what God is saying, here's the way to take advantage of this, this present situation to continue to advance the work of the kingdom. I mean, so ask yourself the question, when was the last time you invited God into your world, in, into your context? The promise is this, when you invite God into those situations, when you say, God, I, I want to intentionally meet with you, but I want you to meet with me, he will show up. And when he does, he brings a whole host of, of things to you. He brings gifts to you of joy and peace and resilience. Anxieties can come, but they don't stick. Fears surface, but they're going to, to leave. Struggles are going to come for sure, but so does God. When we pray, prayer is not a privilege for the pious. It's not something that's just for a chosen few. Prayer is simply a heartfelt conversation between God and his children. So I come back to that passage we started with in Ephesians 5, verses 15 through 17. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, 
but understand what the Lord's will is. So here's a challenge I want to give to you. We're, we're going to do a variation of something that's called the John Wesley Great Experiment. Now, I'm going to post some information on this on our website, so at ferndalefmc.com. All right. When you go to that, that home page, uh, you're going to see something that pops up that says the John Wesley Great Experiment. When you click that, it's going to open up a PDF document, some things that you can read. You can read them there. You can print them out if you would want. But here's the essence of the John Wesley Great Experiment. And it's a challenge that I would like you to pick up and take for this week. I'm just challenging you for one week right now. One is this. First, you are going to read your Bible every day. And you can set the pattern of when you would like to read your Bible. You can set the time when that would be. And there are going to be some suggestions for us to, to read. Now, what I'm going to suggest is that we read through the book of Ephesians. In fact, we're putting a Bible reading plan on our church app that's just a reading plan for the book of Ephesians. But there's information about this when you go to our website as well. The second part of the John Wesley Great Experiment is this, regularly praying for others. So what it's going to involve for you is to keep a list of some, some persons that you would pray for on a daily basis. Now, this does not have to be an exhaustive list. Don't make it so large that you would never you know, fulfill that. It may be that you say that there are going to be up to about 10 people that specifically God has laid on my heart to pray for on a regular basis. And then the third part of this is that each day you do an intentional act of kindness, even while we're in isolation. Now that part becomes challenging because what you're doing is to say, okay, God, who is someone today you want me to encourage or to do something for in a specific way? Now you can do that again. That, that might be sending a, a text or a, an email. It might be that you, you send a card. It may be that you provide some kind of blessing, like an online gift that they could redeem or something, but however God would lay it on your heart. But for one week, every day you would say, I am intentionally going to do an act of kindness. And then the very last part, the fourth component is this, you just keep a journal just simply a piece of paper, a notebook, something that would say, you know, here's what God is teaching me. Here's something that I read in the Bible that, that spoke to my heart. I mean, whatever. Again, I would keep it simple. Don't try to make this so big that, that you aren't uh, faithful to follow through with that. Now, the plan for the week would be, and a challenge that I would give to all of us as a church and for those who are you're listening, wherever you are, is just read through the book of Ephesians. Uh, again, whatever, whatever plan you want to do with that. Uh, that you would have this daily habit of prayer and that you would journal your thoughts, uh, your, what God has spoken in your heart, even making a list of some of the act of kindnesses that God laid on your heart. If you do this, church, you will fulfill our mission, connecting with God, connecting with others, growing in your relationship with God through Bible study and through prayer, and serving others through these daily acts of kindness. Again, as we close it out, Ephesians 5, 15 and 17, be very careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. The unwise thing will be just to ignore this. The unwise, they'll continue to go on with life just as they're, they're doing it. But if we come back and we make the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil, these are difficult times here, God is, going to, is giving us an opportunity right now to respond to his leading. These days are uncertain. But don't let these opportunities we, that God has given you pass you by. Uh, let's, let's not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And his will, first of all, is that you would be saved. You place your trust in him. His will is that you would have a vibrant prayer life. His will is that you would know his word. His will is that you would serve others. And so let's act on that right now. I want to close this message just with a word of prayer. And, and I'm asking you to commit uh, to, to respond to God's leading, but I specifically want to pray for those who are responding to God speaking to your heart to place your confidence in him right now. Let's pray, and then I'll close out our time. Lord, I thank you that you're, you're present with us, and I thank you that, that each of us are sensing in our own heart you are calling us to move forward in our life, in our relationship with you, even in this current situation. But right now I'm praying for those that are listening to this message that are making a commitment to place their full trust in you. Jesus, you've spoken to their heart today, but the reality is you've been working in their heart for days and weeks, maybe even years before, to bring them to this point that they would say, Jesus, I know that you truly did live and die and rise again. I know you are the Savior of the world. 
I'm placing my faith in you today. And so, Lord, I know you're hearing that prayer. I pray you just speak to those, their hearts right now. Yes, I, I hear your faith. I'm responding to that faith. It is by grace you are saved through faith. And so you are speaking assurance to them that they are in a new relationship with you, Jesus. They are saved. Lord, I, I pray for every person that's saying, I want to commit to serve you, to grow in my faith, my relationship with you, to, to fulfill the mission you've given to me, to help us fulfill the mission you've given to us as a church, even during these times. And I pray that you would bless every, every moment that's spent in scripture. I pray you would open up our minds to understand your truth. I pray that we would receive that life, Jesus, that your very words bring to us. I pray that you would make our times in prayer so rich and meaningful and that you would work in response to our prayers. I pray, God, that you would give direction to us about how we can serve you and do acts of kindness, acts of service to other people throughout this coming week. So, Lord, bless these times for your kingdom's sake and for our lives' sake. We pray in your name, amen. So we've had a great day together and we've, we've heard all kinds of opportunities of how we can make a difference. Now, I wanna reiterate, going back as we just recap. So if you are giving food to our outdoor food collection box that Sherry mentioned early in the service, again, that is if you're going out, you're already doing some, some grocery shopping, we're not asking you to do any unintentional trips, don't do that. But if you're already going out and uh, making some food purchases, if you can add some things to that list, drop it off. The, the drop box is outside the doors of our fellowship hall. You'll see a picture of it. Uh, as I make this announcement, you'll see what that looks like so you know what you're looking for. Follow through with that. As a response to what the, the things that Laura said for parents and children, there are some action steps you can take. Pastor Michael's given action steps. We've seen Karen Friedrich show how she responded, what God laid on her heart. There are all kinds of things that we can do to be fulfilling the mission that God has done for us today. I hope you found encouragement with this today. Here's what I'm gonna ask you to do, the final request. Email me and send me some examples of here's what you're doing. Email me and show me how you've seen some things of God's unexpected blessings in your life. I want to hear from you about in this time of isolation, how you've seen God work and how you're seeing God allow you to serve him during these times. I mean that sincerely. I want to try to be able to highlight those in, in an upcoming service. And so if you would send those things to Pastor Scott at ferndalefmc.com, I will greatly appreciate them. I'll respond to every email that I receive. So please do that. That would be an encouragement to me, and I think it will be an encouragement to the church just as we go on for the next coming weeks. Well, that's it for today. Thank you so much for tuning in for this worship service. We're going to be meeting back here again next week, uh, continuing on with, with this same theme. You can't quarantine the mission. Uh, God bless you. Serve him faithfully today and enjoy the presence of the Lord uh, today and in the days to come. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.